Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. to season two episode 14 of the killer t on today's episode we will be discussing wesley allen dodd the vancouver, the vancouver child, child, child killer, killer. killer we are your hosts chelsea and christina welcome back back on the bullshit and once again it feels like it's been forever since we recorded but it's been the usual usual amount of time well no we are actually recording like three days later than we normally than do. Than what we normally do. But it's fine. Life's hard when you hustle. <laughs> hustle, baby, hustle. <laughs> so, I guess we need to start this one off with a pretty decent-sized trigger warning. <sighs> As yeah. mom, this shit fucking sucks. I was horribly disgusted while doing research and notes. And today we are going to be talking about a true textbook definition of a pedophile. So, unfortunately, to tell his story, we do have to tell a bit more about his crimes. And that can be a little bit hard to hear. So, you know the drill. It might not be your cup of tea. Tune into the next one. (laughs) Yeah. Without further ado... But you can't wait to get this one started, Chelsea. Wesley Allen Dodd was born in Toppenish, Washington to Carol and Jim Dodd and would end up being the oldest of three children. While the children were well cared for, there was not a lot of love in their household. (laughs) Jim and Carol would fight a lot. They had a very strenuous relationship and the children grew up with that tension in their homes and in interviews it is said that they just didn't really show a lot of love that Wesley even said that he didn't remember hearing the words I love you Mm -hmm. and you know just kind of a okay childhood but not a lot of emotional support there. It's said that Wesley kind of grew up playing second fiddle to his younger brothers. And because of this, he always felt emotionally kind of neglected or dismissed. Like his needs weren't as cherished or seen or valued as his siblings. People would describe the relationship between his father and mother as a loveless marriage. But just like how you were describing, not only is the lack of affection present in the marriage but it's also present with the children he even describes never getting hugs never being told i love you like you said but also you know playing games together as a family weren't really a thing his only memory of playing a board game and spending quality family time together in that traditional way Mm -hmm. ended with his mother and dad screaming at each other about who owed who money you know great family memories maybe not the best of situations but certainly not the worst the kids were fed they went to school they weren't tardy a bunch you know Mm -hmm. nobody was being physically and mentally abused just kind of distant and neglected in that respect yeah now i have a little mental note that i wrote down because it describes um the research I'm, i'm referring to describes his brother being born a year after he was and that he would sleep with him and take baths with him and bathe the him and this continued until he was seven years old and they almost mentioned this as, as if it was unusual but as one of three kids that was like all the time in my household yeah and I mean I have three children and it is not unusual for me to pop all three of them in the tub together just to be like okay bath time let's get everyone done one two three and we're done 
I actually used to look forward to that bath time and stuff because it meant we got to play with a shit ton of toys and right yeah this it just wasn't unusual i, I mean, mean the age of seven that doesn't seem that unusual especially with his brother only being a year younger, younger than, than him. him not not weird and i then would crawl into share... my sister's bed until i was like 10 years old to yeah. like be able to cuddle with her i mean and who knows they may have just shared a room and i mean yeah I, less than a year apart they're what, what do they call that irish twins yep they're basically the same. I don't, re- that doesn't stand out to me as unusual. No. Now, this does seem a little unusual, though. When his little sister was born, he recalls one of the only memories he has of her being a baby was his mom breastfeeding her. Now, that did stick out that to me. That is a little unusual. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, I have a really good uh, recall of my childhood memories. And I think my first memory is just running through our first home as a kid and playing and, you know, stuff with my mom. Like, I remember that stuff really well. And even though I was a breastfed child, I certainly don't have any memories of that. Or all my little cousins were breastfed. I don't ever remember that. So it just seems unusual to me that, like, that's what sticks out to him. The breast sticks out to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have very few memories of my childhood. My brain just... (laughs) <laughs> decided none of that was important i mean i know that my cousins were breastfed mm-hmm. but that's more of a i know that to be a fact than to actually remember witnessing it yeah does so that make sense? i agree with you it's just kind of odd he does also remember going to the doctor's office or the hospital to have his tonsils removed and his mom was prepping him for the surgery when he peed himself and he remembers that feeling of embarrassment and this is going to be the first of a couple instances where he specifically remembers embarrassment at a very very young age and I feel like that's kind of telling because embarrassment does play a role in a lot of other serial killers Mm. I mean I'm sure we've all had accidents especially at four when you're literally going through potty training, especially for boys, probably yeah, around that time. it's not unusual for boys. I mean, it's not unusual for any four-year-old to have an accident on occasion. I mean, it happens. Yeah, but that, the embarrassment stuck out to him. So I kind of want to speculate maybe that his mother may have had a big reaction to that. And that's why. Well, I mean, the shame plays a big role in our psyches and how we process things. So I'm sure if she shamed him for it, yeah, that would cause a lasting impression there. At eight years old, he and his cousin sexually experimented by touching their penises together. I know it's very, very, very common for young boys to be curious about their anatomy. Mm. Not so sure about the rubbing them together thing. I mean, it is common for young boys to be very interested in their penises and wanting to show them off. (laughs) But the rubbing them together is... Bit weird. Bit weird. At nine, his mother made him change his clothes in front of his aunts. This is another moment where he experiences embarrassment and shame. And again, is another thing to me that like... And my family, especially around Halloween time or like we were always playing outside in the mud. So changing in front of family was like never a big deal. I don't know. I don't know. That one's unique to the person, I would think. In 1971, at the age of nine, Wesley experienced what he considers to be his quote unquote first rejection by a girl. He pulled down his pants in front of his then six-year-old cousin, or he pulled down his pants in front of his six-year-old neighbor, and when she refused to look at him, he took that as rejection and would attribute this later in life as the reason that he began preferring boys over girls. It didn't take very long after this for him to start realizing that he had very different interest compared to other children yeah and would spend his spare time instead of you know going out and playing with everyone and doing that kind of stuff he would look and seek out nudie magazines and dirty magazines 
and just anything of like a sexual nature that mm-hmm. he could kind of get his hands on. Which, again, we are kind of approaching puberty at this time. So it's not unusual for boys to go, hoo, 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 boobs, and, yeah. you know, all that stuff. Around the age of 11, while in junior high school, Wesley began getting picked on by his peers. His peers were picking up that he had more interest in boys than girls. And this especially became apparent when a boy had asked Wesley to shower with him and the word had gotten out to his peers that this had been requested wesley was the one bragging about it i don't think it occurred in his brain that it was unusual yeah so he was the one actually telling people well this is what led to even more bullying by his classmates and later that same year Wesley's friend told him about how his stepdad had to use a catheter to use the bathroom. And this led Wesley to start experimenting with his body. And he would put straight pins and the filler of ink pens into his penis. He would insert them like a catheter. Was that Albert Fish who also used to do that? Albert Fish would put pins into his pelvis and his like general groin area. And also pedophile. Yeah. Interessante. Wesley said that he would trick his victims by saying that he could do tricks kind of like a sword swallower to lure them to his house and then he would molest them. So he is molesting other children as early as the age of 12, Mm -hmm. 11, 12. And I know Christina did some research on child sexual dysfunction that would probably fit really well here. When Chelsea and I research the psychology, we usually refer to either white pages written by people who are in experimental psychology or they're, this is their area of expertise or they, it's been well researched by other accredited psychiatrists. And we try to do our best work here. So... I found an article by Nancy D. Kellogg, who is an MD at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, and this was posted on the American Academy of Family Physicians website, which I've never used to cite before, but it did look really professional and everything was well written. There were some citations at the end of it, so even though I'm not familiar with this website, I feel like it was a good yeah one. american academy of family physicians that's gonna be pretty credible okay okay so this is a pretty big chunk of stuff and i know talking about sexual dysfunction and pedophilia in children is going to be uncomfortable you can't have this conversation without getting uncomfortable so strap in i think it's applicable to this situation we're gonna do this <laughs> we're gonna have this conversation let's all be adults here Kellogg's research says that sexual behaviors in children are common, occurring in 42 to 73 percent of children by the time they reach 13 years of age. So this is important to mention because a lot of people don't understand that you can see children, prepubescent children, acting out in sexual ways. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's inherently sexual for them. As an adult, it can be interpreted that way, but also it can just be sexual. Developmentally appropriate behavior that is common and frequently observed in children includes trying to view another person's genitals or breasts, which we just talked about, standing too close to other persons, which Chelsea's daughter loves to do, (laughs) (laughs) and touching their own genitals. Sexual behaviors become less common, less frequent, and are more covert after five years of age. Sexual behavior problems are defined as developmentally inappropriate or intrusive sexual acts that typically involve coercion or distress, which is what we are seeing Mm -hmm. with Dodd. Such behaviors should be evaluated within the context of other emotional and behavioral disorders, socialization difficulties, and family dysfunction, all of which apply to Dodd, (laughs) including violence, abuse, and neglect. Although many children with sexual behavior problems have a history of sexual abuse, most children who have been sexually abused do not develop sexual behavior problems. 
Children who have been sexually abused at a younger age, who have been abused by a family member, or whose abuse involved penetration are at greater risk of developing sexual behavior problems. Although age-appropriate behaviors are managed primarily through reassurance and education of the parent about appropriate behavior redirection, sexual behavior problems often require further assessment and may necessitate a referral to Child Protective Services for suspected abuse or neglect. That's a big long way of summarizing that sometimes when kids are being sexually abused, they reenact it elsewhere, which again, we have seen in other serial killers. Yes, we have. To me, I'm on board with the research thus far. Sexual behavior problems have been associated with other emotional and behavior disorders in childhood. In a clinical sample of children 6 to 12 years of age with sexual behavior problems, the most common comorbid diagnoses were conduct disorder, 76%, followed by attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, 40%, and oppositional defiant disorder, 27%, And these externalizing behavior problems have been strongly associated with sexual behavior problems in childhood. Nine, suggesting that in some instances, sexual behavior problems are better understood and treated by addressing the etiology of externalizing behaviors. So that's interesting. How do you interpret that information? Well, conduct disorder is a biggie. Conduct disorder is a severe condition characterized by hostile and sometimes physically violent behavior and a disregard for others. Children with CD exhibit cruelty from early pushing, hitting, and biting to later more than normal teasing and bullying, hurting animals, picking fights, theft, vandalism, and arson. Wow. So that is conduct disorder, which was 76% of this study also had conduct disorder. And then we know what attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder is. An oppositional defiant disorder is a disorder in child marked by defiant and disobedient behavior to authority figures. The cause of oppositional defiant disorder is unknown, but likely involves a combination of genetic and environmental factors. Family stress and dysfunction, including violence, abuse, and neglect, can cause or exacerbate externalizing behaviors and sexual behavior problems in children. The number and frequency of sexual behaviors in children increase with the number of family stresses, including violence between parents, incarceration, and deaths of family members, illnesses requiring hospitalization as well. In a study of 201 children with sexual behavior problems, 48% were sexually abused. That's staggering. 32% were physically abused, 35% were emotionally abused, and 16% were neglected. One meta-analysis found that 28% of children who were sexually abused developed sexual behavior problems with the highest prevalence in the youngest of age groups. Sexual abuse involving a father figure perpetrator and penetrative acts is more likely to result in sexually aggressive behavior in the child. You can apply a lot of this to past people that we have covered. Oh, 100%. And while there's no proof or commentary from Dodd about being sexually abused. Yeah, he really only says he ever felt neglected and that his mother occasionally hit him. But there was the you know, witnessing his parents fighting and having a loveless marriage and the lack of attention. So why not all the boxes are checked here? A couple of them are. A couple of them are. And I know that was really wordy and we were reading it verbatim from the research. But again, it's something that if we're going to talk about this, we might as well talk about some of the facts behind it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, hopefully you're still here. In the spring of 1975, so Wesley is 13 now, He began flashing young children. He would often stand naked in his bedroom window while children were on their way to school. But eventually, this would get him into trouble. And so to avoid getting into more trouble, he would ride his bike around the neighborhood and flash young boys. He said that he chose to flash boys because, quote unquote, boys didn't report me as often as girls. He claims to have exposed himself to as many as 40 children during the two months that he did this, and he often used his parents' bickering and lack of emotional support as the reasoning for his actions. 
In July of that same year, he ends up being reported to the police for exposing himself. The police come to Wesley's house, but he was actually not punished for this. Wesley began to fear getting caught and so began masturbating on a daily basis and experimenting with his genitals. And this is very Albert Fish-ish. Mm-hmm. He would put the band of his watch around his genitals and would squeeze his testicles through. It's just so uncomfortable. And then would attach a cord to the band and then would attach weights to see how much he could hold. Why? By the age of 14... His parents have this the, a looming divorce. It's going to happen. I can imagine his home life wasn't the greatest right now. There's probably a lot of fighting going on if they haven't already separated. Not a whole lot of commentary on it right here, but we know that this was a distressing time for him. He now escalates from being a voyeuristic person. A flasher. <laughs> to a full-fledged child molester. At 14. Again, to reiterate, he's, he's 14. 14. My daughter is 14 right now. I can I cannot even fathom. I can, doesn't even process. But he started with those closest to him because those closest to him are going to be, A, the most opportunistic, mm-hmm. and B, he's going to have more control and influence over his cousins and siblings than probably anybody else. They're more likely to trust him and he's more likely to get them alone. He experimented sexually and assaulted his 10-year-old sister's friend and then his 8-year-old female cousin and her 6-year-old little brother. Shortly after that, he snuck into his sister's room at night and mind you, she's 10 years old, And while she was sleeping, he put her hand on his groin and pulled down her pants with the full intent of raping her. But she woke up and like shoved him away. So luckily it didn't happen. However, by the fall of 1975, he had devised a plan to lure his eight-year-old male cousin into essentially being assaulted by him by playing this game, quote, game, tug of war where he tied a string to both ends of their penises and then when it was over he he raped his eight-year-old cousin i think it's also really important that at this point we talk about his parents and what they knew about what was going on wesley and his father would have these father and son chit chat and his father knew about his son's sexual antics but they did nothing to get their son help they didn't even really talk about it they didn't know they didn't even talk about it and in one of the podcasts that i was listening to while doing my research and obviously this is just you know from the podcast i was listening to that his father had said well my son wasn't doing drugs he wasn't smoking he wasn't drinking like he was a good kid he was just doing this other stuff you know what fuck that i think i would be more concerned regardless he should have gotten help his dad was well aware he should have gotten fucking help from december of 1975 through january of 1976 wesley got a bicycle for christmas that year and would continue flashing himself around town and he had at least 10 victims during this one month long period he also began letting his Mm. dog lick his rear because he enjoyed it and in order to get his dog to do this he would rub feces on his butt and penis and then one day the dog bit him his dog bit him and so he decided to rub it on other areas of his body because apparently that wasn't enough for him to learn his lesson. So while his parents weren't aware of the sexual exploitation of the children and their other and their personal children, mm-hmm. like you had said, they knew that something was going on. Well, I mean, the cops had already been called on him once mm-hmm. at this point. But even 
knowing all that and knowing their son needed more support, they still weren't willing to do it. So in a very old documentary that I watched done by Frontline, they actually interview his old band instructor. And he makes this comment about how you could tell that he had a troubled life. And when the interviewer asks him how, he kind of pauses to think about it and says, well, kids don't always come outright to say what's going on at home, but you can tell whenever mom and dad don't show up for concerts and extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of proof that they just didn't give a shit. So there is some substance to the neglect. In May of 1976, his parents finally get divorced. And this is probably the best thing his parents probably could have ever done for their children. And in August of that same year, Wesley decided he was tired of just exposing himself and that he needed physical contact. And in order to fulfill this wish, he went to the Sacagawea Elementary School and found three boys and three girls all between the ages of seven and ten and he tricked them into playing a guessing game where he would put his penis in their hands. He That family home was right next to or very close to this elementary school mm-hmm. so it wasn't a long long haul he was yeah. right there. He, so again very opportunistic on his hand and he would continue to play these weird games these games are how he enticed the children and because they're young and curious they go and and he's a, a teenager so like they already trust him right i mean keep in mind he still is only 14 almost 15 when this is happening At 15, Dodd was arrested for exposing himself to two more little girls from ages 8 to 10. But again, for the second time, he was not prosecuted. Instead, police and authorities recommended that he go to counseling, which, hello, is very apparent. He should have been in counseling as soon as his parents noticed all this shit, but I digress. So over time... Dodd would occasionally go back and forth with counseling more out of necessity than actually wanting to do it himself, but he was never like rigorous or routine with it. It was usually imposed by courts, but Dodd stated that he was not afraid of the law because he had molested so many children and exposed himself numerous times to children before being caught. So while the first time may have made him change his routine a little bit, he's now gotten away with it twice. Right. So the intimidation really isn't there for him. Well, at this point, there's no consequences for his actions. Dodd is a teenager, and he's pretty decent looking. He's average intelligence, but he's really sweet and quiet and reserved, and his teachers would describe him as being on time. And anytime they would ask him to do something, he'd be the first to get it done. They, he was very reliable. And this was the same impression that he made on everyone. Neighbors trusted him. He was a babysitter. <laughs> and he used that trust to enable him to take advantage of so many children between the ages of 14 and 18. It's just unfathomable. In 1977, he was asked to fill in for a neighbor's usual babysitter and molested their two sons, ages one and four, and their three-year-old daughter. And he began masturbating in the Columbia High Auditorium, but he was never caught. He also started working as a Christian camp counselor during the summertime break. And he would use this time to, like... It was candy land for him. He would get the kids to play strip poker with him. Because they trusted him and they admired him. Because, again, you have these children, 8 and 10 years old, with this older teenager who, at that time, when you're that young, you think, like, oh, my God, a, a sophomore is hanging out with us. You know, it's kind of a big deal. And he would always give off this authority figure type, but also the cool guy who would help them be in on little secrets and stuff. He was just very good at understanding how to manipulate the mind 
of little kids and he would play on their natural curiosity and like make bets with them and say oh I bet you won't go skinny dipping with me and they'd go skinny dipping with him and he, he would normalize that behavior like he was letting the children in on like this little adult secret like he was teaching them something yeah that only adults got to do During this time, he also began to molest the three-year-old daughter of his dad's girlfriend and his 10-year-old stepbrother. In August of 1979, Wesley met a young boy who was fishing in a secluded wooded area. He asked the boy if he wanted to see something quote-unquote really neat and tried to get the boy to undress, but luckily they were interrupted before the boy was able to be molested by Wesley. During that summer into that fall, Wesley found an empty house near the Sacagawea Elementary School and he would lure small boys to this house and play strip poker with them and molest them. And this fall is when he also realized his only interest was boys and girls under the age of 10 after a girl who was a year younger than him asked him out on a date and he refused to go. Let's have the uncomfortable situation. Again, we're adults here. I know it sucks, but we're going to talk about pedophilia. Now, this is from Psychology Today, which has four different sources at the end and quotes straight from the DSM-5, which if you are not aware, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fifth edition. This is the psychology handbook. This is what gotcha. everybody goes by. This is the word. The Bible. This is the Bible. Roger, Roger. So I'm going to read this verbatim from the Psychology Today site so we don't misinterpret any Anything. of what it's saying. Gotcha. This is the symptoms of pedophilia. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, in order for a pedophilic disorder to be diagnosed, the following criteria must be met. Reoccurrent, intense sexual fantasies, urges, or behaviors involving sexual activity with a prepubescent child, generally aged 13 years or younger, for a period of at least six months. These sexual urges have been acted on or have caused significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. The person is at least 16 years old and at least 5 years older than the child in the first category. However, this does not include an individual in late adolescence involved in an ongoing sexual relationship with a 12 or 13 year old. So if you're a 16 year old boy and you're dating a 14 year old girl, it doesn't count. That's not... Yeah, that's that I not, understand. That's not pedophiles. However, are they also saying, or is it alluding to, that, say, him at 12 years old molesting younger children? Molesting a six-year-old? Yes. That would make him a pedophile. Okay. It has. It would have to be at least five years older than the child. Okay. When he's a teenager. But at, at 12 when he's not a teenager and he's very much so a child that himself. That is on the cusp because they won't diagnose you as a pedophile until you're at least 16. Oh, okay. Now, that's not saying he wasn't. No, he I understand what you mean. He just wouldn't have been diagnosed. Additionally, a diagnosis of pedophilic disorder should specify whether the individual is exclusively attracted to children or not, the gender that the individual is attracted to, and whether the sexual urges are limited to incest. Causes of pedophilia are not known. There is some evidence that pedophilia may run in families, though it is unclear whether this stems from genetics or learned behavior. A history of childhood sexual abuse is another potential factor in the development of pedophilias, although this has not been proven. Behavioral learning models suggest that a child who is the victim or observer of inappropriate sexual behaviors may become conditioned to imitate these same behaviors. Yeah, which is what we talked about Which is what we talked about. Gotcha. These individuals, deprived of normal social and sexual contacts, may seek gratification through less socially acceptable means. Psychological models are investigating the potential relationship between hormones and behavior, particularly the role of aggression and male sexual hormones. Hmm. Pedophiles have been shown to be shorter on average and are more likely to be left-handed, as well as to have lower IQs than the general population. Brain scans indicate that they have less white matter, the connective circuitry in the brain, 
and at least one study has shown they are more likely to have suffered childhood head injuries than non-pedophiles. And we don't know if Dodds has suffered any one of those. We, we know, know that he wasn't super active in sports. Mm-hmm. So, but it, it's interesting to the but commentary on that. But they also say that there may be no rhyme or reason for it. Mm-hmm. You can just be born a pedophile. And I think that that's something that's almost harder for people to swallow than anything else. Mm -hmm. Honestly, at least in my observations of watching how other people react to this kind of stuff and hearing things, every reasonable person has more or less the same reaction to pedophilia. We all just want to punch faces and rip throats out. But it does seem to say that there are some research that people can literally be born pedophiles. Well, and to finish up what this last little bit says... Individuals may become aware of their sexual interest in children around the time of puberty. Ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. Pedophilia may be a lifelong condition, but pedophilic disorder includes elements that can change over time, including distress, psychosocial impairment, and an individual's tendency to act on urges. Now, did you have anything in there about the treatment of it? I know we discussed off mic some treatment. Yeah, we discussed it a little bit offhand. While treatment may help pedophiles resist acting on their attraction to children, many do not seek clinical help because of the risk of legal consequences due to mandatory reporting laws for licensed professionals, including therapists. Mm. For people with pedophilic disorder who do seek help, research suggests that cognitive behavioral treatment models may be effective. Such models may include aversive conditioning, confrontation of cognitive distortions, building victim empathy, such as showing videos of consequences to victims, assertiveness training, which is social skills training, time management, and structure, relapse prevention, identifying antecedents to the behavior or how to avoid high-risk situations, Mm -hmm. and surveillance systems, family associates who will help monitor the patient's behavior and lifelong maintenance. Wasn't there also um, medication to put them on? There are some medications that may be used in conjunction with psychotherapy. Such medications include Provera and Luprolide, which are anti-androgenins to lower the sex drive. Intensity of sex drive is not consistently related to the behavior of paraphiliacs, and high levels of circulating testosterone do not predispose a male to paraphilias. Hormones such as medroxyprogesterone acetate and ciproterone acetate decrease the level of circulating testosterone, potentially reducing sex drive and aggression. These hormones typically used in tandem with behavioral and cognitive treatments may reduce the frequency of erections, sexual fantasies, and the initiation of sexual behaviors, including masturbation and intercourse. So they're essentially trying to give men erectile dysfunction as a preventative measure. Yep, and then they can also use antidepressants because those have been found to decrease sex drive. I know specific to Dodd's case, same interview done by Frontline. They worked with a former actor who runs these programs where he forces the sexual predator to act the role of his victims. Meanwhile, the actual actor putting this stuff together plays the role of the predator and it's meant to condition them for empathy and break them down and has actually at the time of this airing which was probably 20 years ago maybe maybe more there was some progress made and a few of the pedophiles that they interviewed said without that treatment they would not have developed any empathy for what they did now that's not saying that it heals them and they're no longer pedophiles But that disconnect of being able to understand their victim's pain, at least a bridge starts getting formed. I think that was really, really interesting. I'm of of the belief, I don't necessarily think pedophiles can be totally reformed. I think once you're a pedophile, you're a pedophile. But I think that what the research is saying is that when given treatment it's basically just preventative right it's preventative they can't cure you Mm -hmm. well you can't cure someone from being a psychopath yes there are mental there are mental disorders that the treatment is preventative and education and trying to keep tabs on the behaviors gotcha so i mean not every mental disorder has a medication that goes you're cured yes you just have to take this forever (laughs) 
Yeah, okay. I mean, that's kind of the same thing with depression where you're treating it, you're not necessarily curing it. No, but unlike depression, when you take a pill, you feel better. Yeah. When you're a pedophile, they're having to kill your sex drive so you are unable to molest children. Ugh. God. It doesn't take it away. It doesn't take it away. It just makes it less possible for you to. Ugh, why is this just so awful? <laughs> oh, it's about to get worse. Strap in, guys, because this is where I really started to get angry. He's an adult now. He's he's graduating high school in 1979. And in between him graduating and joining the Navy, which is something that he does, he molests some more fucking children. Well, and he attempts to abduct two girls. But of the ages of 11 and 7. But they manage to get away from him and report him to the police. He admits to wanting to molest them and having a whole plan to take them to an isolated area. But he is not incarcerated. He is not incarcerated. He essentially he admits joins to it. the Navy to get away from being incarcerated. I don't know how that gets you away from it, but, you know, that's the information that we have. Because of his high entry test scores, he was actually put on submarine duty and he went to basic training in San Diego, California, and then graduated in the top 10% of his class. So even though he has had basically what's described as average intelligence, he seems to do really well in basic training, but not even the motherfucking Navy can stop him from attacking these children. He targets children on the naval base. Yep. How insane do you have to be to be surrounded by hundreds of soldiers and brazen enough to rape and molest their children? And on top of that, while stationed in the Navy, he would take trips to Seattle and molest children in the bathroom at a movie theater. Mm -hmm. And he would offer money to children in exchange for them to take their pants down. In June of 1982, Dodd goes AWOL from the Navy. And he is actually arrested for asking a nine-year-old boy to disrobe in Richland, Washington. This charge ultimately earns him a general discharge from the service on disciplinary ground. But the case was never pursued. So that means not only are the police well aware of his his sexual history and his crimes and he's gotten away with it, but the fucking military knows that he did this and lets him get away with it. The charges were lowered to attempting indecent liberties on a boy and he served a whole 17 days in jail and was ordered to get counseling. Because he's gotten away with this so much, he's invincible in his mind. And and now these perverse thoughts are starting to transform into wanting to be even more aggressive. Now he's not wanting to take no for an answer. Now he is not willing to be as suggestive. He wants to be demanding. He Mm -hmm. wants to say, I want this. I'm going to take it any way that I please instead of luring and, and exploiting. He's just straight going for it. In May of 1984, he is arrested again for molesting a 10-year-old boy. And despite the fact that his initial sentence would have put him in jail, his sentence is suspended, providing that he attends counseling. So once again, he's arrested. He openly admits to what he was planning to do, and they go, get counseling. That's the thing. He is always pragmatic with officials and authorities about his intentions he is always honest and upfront yep i was gonna molest them yep i was gonna rape them he doesn't try and lie and cover it up later in 1984 he was convicted in idaho for molesting a 13 year old boy and he only served four months out of his 10 year sentence and there is an interview oh with the judge that was over this case. I've heard, I've and heard the this judge one. said that because Wesley had presented himself so well. He was a nice boy. And an, as an upstanding citizen, he reduced his charges. But he also defends himself by saying that he had none of Wesley's previous and crimes that's a fucking in lie. front of him. Frontline investigated that. And what they found was it's a partial truth. He had some of his sexual history, which 
I think was up to five cases. Should have been enough. It should have been enough to put him in prison for glaring. 10 years. It should have been glaring. And regardless, how can the sexual exploitation of children ever be undermined by, well, he seems like a responsible, nice guy. They do it for ra rapists too. That blows my mind. Absolutely sexual blows my mind. Sexual assault in the United States will get you less time in jail than some weed will. Yes. Let's just be upfront and honest about it. This is not going to be the last time that Dodd is caught. It's not even going to be the second to last time <laughs> that Dodd is caught. And some people might even argue and say it's almost as if Dodd wants to be caught. But honestly, he keeps getting away with it. So he probably just really doesn't give a fuck. No. He doesn't ever really receive much jail time. He's not really bothered by it when he does because he gets in and out basically all the time. And a lot of the times he gets away with it as well because parents, which I understand to a degree, don't want to put their children through the trauma of testifying to an entire court of people what happened to them. I get that. Fully understand that. I mean, a couple times he was caught by their parents and their parents just went, I don't want to traumatize my kid any further, so I'm not going to report it. I'm just going to make sure he never sees my children again. Now he has a diary. This was his magnum opus. This is where he put all of his plans and all of his thoughts. And he filled it with drawings and fantasies and vivid descriptions and his thoughts about victims. And he actually starts dehumanizing them by, by instead of calling he, she, they, or mentioning of names, he starts to call them it. Here's an example. Incident three will die maybe this way. He'll be tied down as Lee was in incident two. Instead of placing a bag over his head as, pre as had previously planned, I'll tape his mouth shut with duct tape. Then when ready, I'll use a clothespin or something to plug his nose. That way I can sit back, take pictures, and watch him die instead of concentrating on my hands or the tight rope around his neck. That would also eliminate the rope burns on the neck. I can clearly see his face and eyes now. And then another thing that he says is, he suspects nothing now. We'll probably wait until morning to kill him. That way his body will be fairly fresh for experiments after work. I'll suffocate him in his sleep when I wake up for work, if I sleep. This, the, the mention of the experiments, well, we've evolved again. We now are interested in performing unimaginable experiments on these children. He even went on to talk about an instance where he had sexual intercourse with an 18-month-old son of his co-worker and then slept with the infant's that mother. That was his first sexual experience, consenting could, sexual experience. And said that he could only orgasm by picturing her son, who was 18 months old. That is so disgusting. I fucking can't. I can't. Dodd at one point in time writes in his diary that he made a deal with the devil if the devil would help him obtain victims. This reads to me more like writing a story mm -hmm. that he knows eventually someday will read. It doesn't seem authentic. However, what he says is, I've now asked Satan to provide me a six to ten year old boy to make love to suck and fuck play with, photograph, kill, and do my exploratory surgery on. Yet another page detailed this search for a willing child who could be taught Lucifer's ways to be an assistant to Lucifer through me. He doesn't exhibit any other like satanic cults practices. And if you listen to our episode on Satanism, what he is doing flies directly in opposition of what the satanic tenants describe. Again, he, he would go back later and just tell authorities he wasn't serious about his bargain with the devil. I mean, I honestly think he's writing in this diary because he knows one day somebody is going to read it. Probably. And I think he's playing himself up. But, you know, that's just my interpretation and it could, could be completely wrong. But it's very out of character for all the other things that he says and does because he's very pragmatic. Yeah. You can say that about him because there's tons of interviews of him that you can access where he speaks matter-of-factly 
about himself, his behaviors, his his life. He doesn't put a lot of emotion or bias into what he says. At least that's how I've interpreted it. By 1986, this is when we're escalating. Just molesting and raping children is no longer enough. He wants to kill his victims. And he's quoted as saying, the more I thought about it, the more exciting the idea of murder sounded. I planned many ways to kill a boy. Then I started thinking of torture, castration, and even cannibalism. This is very Dahmer-ish. Mm-hmm. I remember in one of the things I was listening to, he had said how he wanted to create sex zombies, which oh my God. is fucking Dahmer because that's what Dahmer uh. wanted to do. The only difference is Dahmer wasn't molesting children. I didn't hear him say that. That's yeah. fucking, ugh, why? Just Why? Well, Dodd chose the first child that he was going to murder in 1987. And the first victim was supposed to be an eight-year-old boy that he met while working as a security guard. But while he was trying to trick the child to go home with him, the child said that he was going to get some of his toys and told his mom about Wesley and the police were called. Wesley was arrested, but his sentence was reduced to a gross misdemeanor, and he spent a whole 118 days in jail with a one-year probation. I just don't get it, man. In 1989, he was working as a shipping clerk at Pack Paper, and he told his co-workers that he was divorced and his child had recently died of crib death. But he discovers David Douglas Park which was about a mile or so from his new apartment. And he decided this was a good hunting ground. Bear in mind, he's escalating. Oh, he's escalating quickly. He's solely focused now on killing. His urges are so strong to kill that he says he almost fantasizes more about them and gets more release from them than he did about the molesting. And up until this point, we know that he's basically molested 30 or 40 people with impunity. So I think that's really, really that's saying, saying a lot. something. It's all he would think about. Even while he was at work, it occupied every ounce of his brain that, that he wanted to kill this, these children. Labor Day weekend at David Douglas Park, he hid beside one of the trails. His plan was to find children playing by themselves, away from their parents or whatever, opportunistic, and snatch them and then kill them. Initially, he was having some problems because there were some pesky hikers that were all around the kids and the, the, he couldn't find kids that were getting away from their parents. But then Billy, age 10, and his brother Cole, age 11, ended up coming down on their bikes. Dodd told them to get off their bikes and that he wanted them to come with him. They did, and once Wesley kind of got the boys off to the side... Wesley stabbed Billy in the stomach and then attacked Cole as he jumped up and caught him in the side. Billy tried to run away, but Wesley caught him and stabbed him in the shoulder. He wasn't dead, though. Billy was found first, and he was still breathing, still alive, but would die shortly after at the hospital. And Cole's body was found a couple hours later after the parents reported that their children had been missing from what they thought they were doing was collecting golf balls from the local golf course. And ultimately, that's what alerts the police, but they got there too late. This killing was not enough for Wesley. He wanted to perform his quote-unquote experimental surgeries on his victims. And in late October of 1989, Wesley began planning out his next attack and he decided that Saturday afternoons were the best time to find a victim. And this takes us to Lee Izzelli, who was only four years old. And he was picked up at the Richmond School playground after Lee's father had let him and his older brother go to the park and play alone. Lee was taken back to Wesley's apartment in Vancouver, where Wesley would strangle the poor boy to death while he was sleeping and then hung his body by a rope in a little closet in his apartment and take pictures of him. Now, he wanted to take pictures with the intention to show the pictures to his other victims, but also to relive everything. But the main reason was he wanted to show those photographs to other victims he was going to bring into his home. 
He ends up dumping Lee's body at the packed paper plant and discarded all of his clothing by burning it, except for his Ghostbusters underwear, which he kept in a briefcase under his bed. Robert is Lee's father, and he's clinging on to hope. And even though Lee had been missing for quite some time, he made a public statement expressing this hope that Lee would have been taken in by somebody who was lonely and thoughtful and loving. But obviously, that is not what happened. And on November 1st, 1989, the body of Lee was found. Dr. Ronald Turco was the one who prepared the first psychological profile of this killer. And boy, oh boy, was it pretty spot on. He described the killer as being 25 to 35 years old and potentially kicked out of the military if he served. He would be a loner and probably kept photos of his victims or a diary of his offenses, including clipped articles and child pornography. The killer probably chose boys because he saw girls as defective. And while he's 100% correct in literally all of those things, it wasn't the profile that led the police to Dodd. No, composite sketches actually were completed and released to the public. And hundreds and hundreds of calls came in from people who thought they had seen Lee with this person that they were releasing sketches of, but there weren't any solid leads. The investigators attended Lee's funeral hoping that maybe the killer would be there, but Wesley, in this instance, was smart and didn't go to hit the boy's funeral. And he ended up staying with his diary and built a quote-unquote torture rack out of boards and ropes that he was intending to use on his next victims. So Dodd wisens up a little bit and he starts avoiding parks. He decides that he's going to go back to his military days and prowl at the local movie theaters. He went to the New Liberty Theater and was waiting for some young unattended children to come to the restroom. He managed to snag one, but the boy was carrying on and screaming, and this drew attention to what was happening. And eventually, the boyfriend of the child's mother catches him, and he's actually, like, got this guy that was trying to kidnap and molest his essentially stepson. Police come, and he does end up being interrogated by police. This whole incident tips them off and they decide that they want to see if he has any correlation to the death of the near brothers and potentially also lee at first he's going no 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 yeah i mean we said before that he was pretty much straightforward but now we're talking murder murder he says that his original intention was only to molest the boys that you know yada 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 but he ends up changing his tune completely and ends up confessing to the murders and what he's done and ends up going into pretty graphic detail on everything that he's done and i don't know if he's just trying to relive either relive or just completely shock the shit out of the cops and actually tells them where they can find his diary with the pictures. Dodd was charged with three counts of first-degree murder, plus the attempted kidnapping from the theater. Against his lawyer's advice, he pleaded not guilty, but then later changed to guilty. And it was ultimately up to the jury to decide the penalty. And I don't know if this is his I am self-aware being pragmatic and saying, okay, I know this is wrong. I know this is evil and I should just let these people handle me or I'm going to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. He alludes to that later on. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't just allude to it. He straight up says, I cannot be around people. I mean, he even later goes on to say that he would attempt to break out of prison to go and rape, molest, and kill more children. The district attorney made it pretty crystal clear of the verdict that he wanted. He told the jury, Dodd planned child murders. He committed child murders. He relived and fantasized child murders with life in prison without the possibility of parole. Two of those things are still available to him. But they also saved the diary and pictures to show to the jury until after the district attorney made these statements. Dodd's defense attorney called no witnesses and presented no evidence. 
The attorney, Lee Dane, did offer that no sane person would be capable of those heinous crimes. Dodd received the death sentence on July 15th, 1990. So we've mentioned before that attorneys kind of get the shit end of the stick where sometimes you just have to defend the bad guys. Even if you are defending someone who you know is guilty, your job is just to make sure that the state is presenting all of the facts as they are and to make sure that constitutionally no rights are being violated in the realm of Mm -hmm. criminal law. I kind of wonder if Dodd and him had reached a agreement that this was actually what Dodd wanted. I think it is because when you watch the interviews with Dodd, he straight up just is like, yeah, I can't be trusted. You need to kill me. Dodd refused to appeal the death penalty and he specifically chose to be hung, which was something that was basically unheard of since the 60s. I mean, we're talking 1993. Yeah. They don't hang people in the 90s anymore. I'm a little conflicted on his reasoning. He claims that he wants to experience what Lee went through, and I'm not sure if that is a sadistic pleasure thing or if it's his trying to have empathy for his victim. He does know that what he's doing is wrong. He acknowledges that what he is doing is wrong. He also acknowledges that he has no self-control. So I don't know if being finally caught and the system finally not failing to stop him, he is going, okay, what did I do? But he does say to the court, I must be executed before I have an opportunity to escape or kill someone within prison. If I do escape, I promise you I will kill and rape and enjoy every minute of it. Before his execution on June 5th, 1993, his final statement was, this is a direct quote, I was once asked by somebody, I don't remember who, if there was any way sex offenders could be stopped. I said, no. I was wrong. I was wrong when I said there was no hope, no peace. There is hope. There is peace. I found both in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the Lord and you will find peace. There were no apologies for his crimes and no obvious signs of remorse. You found peace through Christ, but you couldn't apologize. Repentance is a huge part of Christianity. You repent for your sins and ask for forgiveness. I have one more thing in my notes about it. He said, I believe what the Bible teaches. I'll go to heaven. I have doubts, but I'd really like to believe that I would be able to go up to the three little boys and give them a hug and tell them how sorry I I was and be able to love them with real true love and have no desire to hurt them in any way. But he never offers a formal apology to the families or acts of repentance. And Chelsea made a point earlier off record where she said he isn't technically a serial killer quite because it has to be three sequential murders that aren't double hitters. Right. And he technically only killed twice, even though there were three victims. And definition of a serial killer is three murders with a definitive cooling off period between. However, he is classified as a serial killer and would have gone on to murder who knows how many more children before being caught so we decided to move on forward with this pile of steaming garbage (laughs) outside of the prison many of the supporters of the death penalty were chanting rhymes like what the heck stretch his neck while the non-supporters wept at the news of his execution Generally speaking, I am iffy on the death penalty. Now the reasoning I don't necessarily support the death penalty is because there are wrong convictions. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Adnan Syed. And <laughs> I believe that with more technology and with more DNA evidence that we will have less of those. But I also think that our justice system is flawed. Mm -hmm. and that people are put away for crimes that they did not commit. And I think it would be a real shame to put someone to death that had not committed the crime that they were convicted for. I'm wholly selfish on this where I want to see their brains while they're living so that we can get the most research Mm -hmm. available. And I wish there was some sort of program that allowed them to submit themselves to scientific studies. Well, we've talked about this before because studying the brain postmortem doesn't help with much. 
It helps a lot with brain physiology and seeing if there's any abnormalities in the size, shape, white matter versus gray matter. I mean, yes, in that aspect it helps, but when we're talking about behaviors, it would be really interesting to do MRIs and see what areas of the brain light up, what areas of the brain mm -hmm. don't light up. When we talked about the happy face killer, there is that one um, neurological doctor who talks about the psychopath's brain and how it is different from a normal mm -hmm. functioning person. Wasn't it brain. John Wayne Gacy who, who the doctor stole, not stole his head, but he gifted her mm -hmm. his brain so she could study it. So she could study it and it's like secured somewhere. Yeah. <sighs> I believe in the death penalty. I think I'll always believe in the death penalty. A lot of people say that um, human beings should never have the right to take the life of any other human beings. And I say that defies nature. I don't disagree with it based on a, it's wrong to take a human life. Mm -hmm. I'm basing it on our science is not perfect yet. Mm -hmm. And I would be devastated if someone who was innocent was put to death. I think yeah. until we can confirm, It would have to be someone like a serial killer yeah, for me. It would have to be 100% accuracy. Yes, they did it. Okay, good. And case closed on all of their victims as well. Yes. I don't enjoy the idea of potent more potential victims being alive out there that the their families will never get closure because they can no longer get confessions from serial killers. Right. I don't know. It's really, really complicated and <laughs> serial killers need to be studied more. Uh, okay, Chelsea. What do you rate this pe bag of pedo shit? Oh, he's a 10 out of 10. He's Fuck him. 10. Burn in hell. Out of 10. Ugh. I'm glad Ugh. they hung him. Yeah. I hope that it fucking hurt, too. Yep. But I'm glad that it was hanging, and I hope that he suffered every second of it. Me, too. Ugh. Ugh. Okay, we need a palate cleanser. Palate cleanser. This is the palate cleanser. It's a picture of Dexter, and it says, you're not a ser serial killer if you bring donuts. It's a picture of John Wayne Gacy, and it says, I like my wine the way I like my boys. About 12 years old and in my basement. <laughs> oh, Gacy, no. Oh, fucking hell. Okay, so it's Dahmer and um, Ed Gein. It says, hey, Ed, heard you're a real ladies' man. Really? What gave you that idea? Maybe the fact that every time I come over, I see women hanging around your house. Oh, oh well. <laughs> It's a picture of Jeffrey Dahmer, and it says, Think about it. Any fight I get is in a food fight. It's Ed Gein, and it says, I want to make a lampshade out of your skin because you light up my life. You know, Jeff, some people make me sick. You should try cooking them longer. Oh, God. I picked up a hitchhiker last night. He seemed surprised that I'd pick up a stranger and asked, Thanks, but why would you pick me up? How do you know I'm not a serial killer? I told him the chances of two serial killers being in one car would be astronomical. Most serial killers are men. That's because women love to kill one man slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking from Facts. personal experience. <laughs> I went to donate blood today, but they kept asking too many questions. Whose blood is this? Where did you get it? <laughs> the way to his heart is through his rib cage. I mean, it's true. You these, can get to the heart through its rib cage. These are facts. <laughs> Hashtag facts. You know the, the drill. drill. <laughs> you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Killer T. You can also listen to us on YouTube. If the Tiki Talk never gets banned, we might be on there someday. We have ideas. Oh, by the way, apologize for things getting a little weird with the last episode. We recently switched um, platforms. Yeah. So we were hosting on Anchor and now we're on Buzzsprout. And things got a little funny for our um, Spotify account. And also on our YouTube channel, which I'm currently still trying to fix. So bear with us. But everything should be normal on your podcasting platforms. YouTube is still just taking a little while. Yeah. Appreciate your patience. And also, you guys are awesome for telling us, like, right away when shit gets fucked up. Yeah, because that lets us jump on it immediately. We don't have every single podcast app on our devices. Mm -hmm. And I usually do check on Spotify. But it was showing, and then it wasn't showing, and then it was showing, and then it wasn't showing. So it was just... 
We don't crazy. have a post production team. The team is me and Chelsea. We are the team. We make mistakes. We are still figuring this stuff out. We're very lucky that we're even capable of editing our podcast ourselves. Mm-hmm. So thank you for letting us have human moments and bearing with us. Um, we appreciate y'all. And if you want to send us an email, you can at thekillert at gmail.com. All right, y'all. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Join us in the next episode where we discuss Robert Rodella, the Kansas, the Kansas City, City Butcher. 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 behavior problem that was too aggressive <laughs> the most common comorbid comorbid is oh. <laughs> <laughs> the most common cor- comorbid diagnosis oh my god It is also much more expensive to kill someone than it is to keep them in prison for the rest of their lives, and hey, I'm all about being a frugal bitch. So. We're all about the studying and the research. But we're lacking serial killers these days. Millennials just aren't killing people like the boomers used to. <laughs> Which is a good thing. Those goddamn millennials killing the serial killer industry. What's wrong with us? song is so fucking stupid. It's like Bailey Sarian. She's like, shinishin, 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 shinishin.